Hello again, it's Tom from Jigsaw here. Welcome back to part two in this series on using survival analysis to understand employee churn. But before we learn about our churn, let's have a brief recap of the last instalment. We introduced the concept of a survival function and how we can use this to compare different demographics in the case of churn. Here, the mode of transport was used to compare churn rates for employees at a fictitious company. It was evident that cyclists were much more likely to survive compared to their peers who drove by car. However, in the previous instalment, I omitted an important feature of the analysis, that is, the notion of censoring. Strictly speaking, censoring is a condition when only part of the observation or measurement is known. That is the ability to take into account missing data, whereby the time to event is not observed. For example, the death in office of a president, or someone leaving a medical study before the study formally concludes. In the case of the latter, you can see that this is really important for the analysis in medical trials. But in both cases, the underlying principle is the same. We made some observations until a given time, but we cannot measure the event. If a president dies after one year in office, how can we possibly know that they would have served two terms? There are different types of censoring. Two commonly discussed ones are left censoring and right censoring. Left censoring is when we only know the upper bound of the time the event occurred. That is, the event occurred at some point to the left of time, that is in the past, but we don't know exactly when. For example, in a medical study, someone dies before the drug trial begins. Whereas right censoring is when only a lower limit of the time is known. We can say that we know the event has occurred at a given time, but it may occur at some point in the future or to the right of time. For example, if a subject leaves a study before the end or the study ends before the event occurs. Let's first look at an example of right censoring in a medical study. In this example, we have 10 subjects in a study that begins at time t equals zero and ends at time t equals 20. Each subject is recorded until either the event happens, which is represented by a circle, or the end of the study is reached, the vertical line at t equals 20. As you can see, we observe the event during the study for the red subjects, and the blue lines represent participants that no event occurred during the study period. Notice that some of the blue lines do end before the current time, but occur after the end of the study period. And this is the critical thing. They have been right censored. If we did not include this into our analysis, we would be underestimating the true average for our subjects. So how does this relate to turnover? Well, in actuality, it is basically the same process, except for a few things. Firstly, we can ignore left censoring, as it is irrelevant for churn. We know when an employee leaves the company and we only deal with right censoring, employees still present at the company. Secondly, and most importantly, in the examples presented previously, we start observing our population all at the same time, T0, which we can set to zero for convenience here. However, time does not have to be an absolute measure and it can instead be relative by using a time duration. In this case, Individuals can start at different times relative to each other, but we measure the time difference between each individual's start and end dates. Again, this is relevant for the case of turnover, since this is the definition of tenure. Let me illustrate this with an equivalent example as the medical study, but this time for turnover. This diagram represents absolute time, the date and year the company was founded until the present day. Employees join and leave the company at different times, which is how it works in reality. We can see that the company has just reached its 20 year anniversary, but unfortunately, one of the founders left before this landmark. We also notice that other employees come and go during the 20 years, with some new starters still present at the company. The company therefore started with three employees, which are its founders, currently has five employees still present, and has had a total of nine over its entire history, not the biggest company in the world. The maximum possible tenure is held by two of the founders at 20 years. In this example, anyone still present at the company at their 20 year anniversary party has been right censored, while people who left before and missed a great party are not censored and we observe the event. Now, 
we can translate the previous diagram, which is measured in absolute time, into a slightly different representation, instead taking our time measure as relative, which we understand as tenure. Using tenure instead of company age as our x-axis then allows us to apply survival analysis to turnover, whilst taking into account right sensory. That concludes part two of the series on survival analysis. I hope by now I'm starting to convince you that this old school method is not too bad. In the next part, I will examine some of the methods used to estimate survival functions, so stay tuned.